Good evening. My name is Matthew Post. I'm the principal here at Briscoe Middle School. It's my pleasure to welcome you to our, our next in a series of our community presentations uh, regarding the new Beverly Middle School. Tonight's topics include uh, technology, school routines, and then security. So we have a variety of people who are going to do some presentations tonight. Um, and then at the conclusion of kind of each section, breaking it into thirds, the conclusion of each section, there will be some time uh, to answer some of the questions you may have regarding that portion of the presentation. So I really appreciate you guys coming out tonight on a, on a night. Dr. Hershey made it easy for us by canceling school tomorrow, so we can go all night if we have to to make this work. Uh, Dr. Hershey does want to also welcome you, so I'd like to ask Dr. Hershey to come and speak to you for a moment. Good evening. As Matt said, um, we're going to kind of split this up into three topics. They're all very large, um, and we realize that, um, but we want to go through this. Additionally, BevCam, thank BevCam, they're actually filming this this evening, so we will be able to make sure that that is actually streamed out to people. Um, also, the presentation will be up on the website tomorrow, as long as I have power. Um, you never know. Uh, what we're going to try and do is focus first on technology, um, some discussion about we're going to have one-to-one -one access, that has been our goal for this building. Uh, second is what grade five and six would look like in grade seven and eight. Next is routines, pick up and drop off um, for both busing and parents. This site has been thought out very carefully from the standpoint of how we're splitting that out movement in the building, and also transportation. Uh, I apologize already, transportation is going to be very short because Bill Burke is retiring at the end of the month and we have a new person coming on and I didn't think somebody who had been doing this for two weeks should necessarily be coming here to talk about transportation. And then finally security, uh, design elements that address security um, as we built this building and as this was thought out from the standpoint of design. So I'll turn it over right now to Judy uh, Miller and also Terry Konitz going to help. Hi everybody. Uh, Steve Palomo is also here. He's the director of IT. I'm the director of digital learning and I'm here to talk about our vision and plan. Um, speaking of vision, I, I want, how many of you order from Amazon? Raise your hand. How many have ever received something like this? Oops. I like that. It's like, what's up, Amazon? My little thing in the little box comes in a big box. It's crazy. Anybody ever had that? So I, I don't know. I think it's a problem. And so did the fifth graders at Centerville. The fifth graders at Centerville took a good look at this problem this year. And they created a um, project based. The teachers, Ms. Hopkins and Mr. Melanson, cre created a project-based learning unit that was revolved all around this problem. Basically, the kids are asking, isn't there a better way for Amazon to package their stuff? And what's the problem? Why should they change? I was in there, the kids were brainstorming. They said, obviously, waste of cardboard, waste of energy, bigger boxes, bigger trucks to cart ca ca all this stuff around. It's a waste of money. So the project, they were charted with design new box that efficiently contains a set of objects and present their results to the class. Oh, and by the way, it was also a math lesson. That was a big secret. So first of all, they got some objects. And they had to kind of mess around the objects and decide how big the box needed to be. Then they needed to determine the volume of the box. So they had to do some measuring. They had to have the most efficient box they could figure out. Then off and on, like the teachers taught lessons on volume, but the kids also watched videos, went through programs like TED Marks to learn on their own and at their own pace during this. And it was also hat day, by the way, you'll see hats through here. They ha I learned a new word, it's a net. It's also called a pattern. The kids created a pattern based on the dimensions they came up with. They had to use the pattern to cut out the box. Oh, by the way, they're also working in teams on this. There were four teams in both classes, all three classes actually. And they had to collaborate continually to decide all the things about the box. They built the box. And then here's an example of one of the final projects 
they got to kind of decorate the box. And finally, they had to work on their presentation to the panel of judges, kind of pretend Amazon judges, and also their colleagues in the class. And they had to give an overview of what they were doing, how they did it, how they worked together. So question, what drove this instruction? This is a quiz for you all. I want to see. Was it the technology? You're supposed to be shaking your head like this. No. <laughs> Was it learning how to determine volume? Was it an authentic real world problem? <laughs> Good. Our vision is the more authentic, the more, the more authentic a lesson is or instruction is, the more engagement equals more learning. And also collaboration was really important. I loved one quote from, two, I heard two, ki one ch two kids talking to each other and one said, hey, I like your idea. Your idea goes really good with my idea. The teachers did a great job with the collaboration. So I'm really fired up about this. Oh, right, I'm now going to talk about technology. Um, as you can tell from this, the technology wasn't in the driver's seat here. It's a tool to support rigorous, personalized, project-based instruction. It's just a tool. And we believe it should be there when you need it. You shouldn't have to wait in line. Like, what if you had to wait in line work to use your laptop? You know, the, Students, when they needed to measure those boxes, they should have had, they have, they need to have the technology available. So therefore, we have a plan for one-to-one -one access for the new middle school. Um, we're going to have wireless, high-speed internet capability, even in the outdoor courtyard. So kids can go outside with iPads and take pictures, make movies. I mean, it's really exciting. They, we're going to have a combination of iPads and Chromebooks. Now these two devices are changing rapidly, so we're, we've kind of waited as long as we can, so we make sure we make the decision on the latest versions of the devices. We're looking at having a one-to-one -one model in grades seven and eight, and also in five and six, probably 16 devices per classroom, maybe even more than that. These, oh, by the way, the 7th and 8th isn't going to be a lease program like the high school. They're going to be district-owned devices. Maybe they'll go home. We're still talking about that. Right now, we're piloting both of these devices in classrooms. And, you know, just to, so teachers and students can see what it's like in a one-to-one -one classroom. I have a quote up here from one teacher that said, when you have one-to-one, -one, one device for every student in a classroom, it's a game changer. So, I mean, that's the feedback we've gotten so far. It's kind of exciting. So that's our device plan. We're also going to have extensive presentation everywhere in this building. 60-inch LCD monitors on carts in every classroom, uh, LED projectors available to the teachers if they need additional projection, 80-inch LCDs in larger rooms or rooms that can't have a cart. Um, the cafeterias will be other places where you can have give presentations, digital signage throughout the school. And also, it's pretty cool, we're going to have these voice <coughs> amplification systems in every room. So teachers can just talk in this kind of voice and not have to raise their voice. All the students can hear. It's proven that this really helps students learn. Um, and that will be in every classroom in the school. <coughs> we're going to have a media makerspace, which we're very excited. Bev Cam has helped us design this. It's in the library. It's going to be like a mini BevCam studio with a green screen and equipped to do um, productions. Really helpful for those project-based learning um, projects like the one I showed you. And that, that's going to be in the library. And also, as always, what's really important to us is professional development. Our teachers have had access to both of these devices for several years. So it's, it's, the devices aren't really new to the teachers in the school. Um, we've had project-based learning. We're starting our third cohort this summer. And I showed you a project earlier that was a fifth grade project, lasted three weeks, and I took about two minutes to show you. But there's other great, there's some teachers in the room that have, um, at Briscoe, at all grade levels, that have 
done project similar projects that are start with that driving question and engage the students. So we're really working on that. We've been working on it for two years and we're going into our third year for that. And then um, we've, used, we've had a lot of training on Discovery Ed, which is for grades five and six, which is an online science and social studies <coughs> program and also supports the project-based learning that I showed you before. And Moodle, which is our, we call it our learning management system. It's kind of the digital hub. The teachers can centralize every, all the digital resources they have in their classroom in one place, which really helps students and teachers stay organized in this digital world. And finally, all, like I said, all of this supports that vision I described to you earlier, which is that project-based, personalized, kind of blended learning, blending the technology with quality and structure. And I believe that's my last slide. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions for me? Yes. So, uh, in the maker spaces, well, there's a thing called Makey Makey, and it's a little board that you can use in computer. I've heard of that, yeah? Yeah, yeah. you've got a computer and you can use like bananas Wow. Are we going to get some of that? We have some. We have some. We have some. Cool, huh? Yeah. Yes. Um, we haven't talked about that yet, but that's something we'll consider. We'll consider that. Anything else? Any other questions about technology? Okay. Oh. No, we're planning to have one-to-one -one access in the classrooms. There's going to be enough mobile devices available so that in the classroom. Excuse me? So there'll be 60 in the class and then carts. We'll have carts. Yeah, there'll be carts available. Teachers could swap, you know, com combine the 16 devices. Um, there'll be lots of ways to get that access. Yes? We will have, <coughs> we are a Google district, like I, I think I might have skipped over that bullet, but we've been doing Google training for several years. But so, that yes, so yeah, uh-huh. So well. It's helpful. Yes. Any? Okay, who's up next? Matt, thank you everybody. Next time, we're talking about the routines in the middle school. Um, I think one of the big things is, is we've, we've worked and we've had a plan developed with the, with the city and we have a traffic expert who's coming to work with us, talking about uh, parent and bus and parent drop-off. Okay? We're going to have different entrances and in, in, in egresses for parents and cars. During the course of the day, we'll have uh, parts of that area that will be gated off. Uh, the parking, uh, separate parking areas, uh, both in the front of the building and the back of the building for staff. And we're trying to create some solid traffic flow onto Balch and Cabot as we enter into this new, this new building. If you work with me, this will be a uh, plan for the morning drop-off. We have Cabot Street right here. The green would be a, a, a parent drop-off in cars. So you have a, a, a one-way entrance right here, enters in, uh, into the um, to this visitor parking area here, you can drop off for students here. That's the front entrance right there. And then parents can uh, one-way exit back onto Cabot Street, okay? Over here, we have the bus drop-off. So buses will be entering from Cabot, going through this teacher parking lot, going in front of the, um, in front of the building, dropping off students here, and they'll be falling forward and then ending their day into the bus lot that is in the back of the building, the bus, uh, where the um, bus transportation department will be housed. 
Over here on Bald Street, you have parent entrance here as well. So parents can come in, drop off students here in front, and then come back around and exit, the, uh, exit back onto Bald Street. So morning drop off, this is the plan that we have right now. Again, go quickly and make sure this is Cabot Street. We have a parent drop off, one way drop off here. Students will enter into the front of the building. Then you have a one way entrance for buses only through the teacher parking lot. They'll be dropped off in this area here. They enter into the cafeteria, into the building here. And then they proceed through, um, through the parking lot, then back home to the bus depot here. So this is what we plan on looking for, for um, drop off in the morning. Afternoon's not gonna be much different. Again, we have, we'll start with the car drop off. We have parent, you can have parent pickup in this area. Again, much like we just talked about for the, uh, for the morning drop off. Also have parent uh, pickup over here in this area here in the parking lot, back onto Balch. And again, what we'd have here, the only difference is buses will be lined up in this area, okay? Currently we have buses in the front and the back of the building. We'll have all our buses in a line in this area here. Uh, the gates would be open so that could occur. Students will load onto the buses and then they'll exit onto Ball Street. So that's the projected plan right now for the, for the drop-offs and the pickups for, um, for the students in the morning with the new middle school. As we get into the building, there's some uh, separation built in as well. You know, there's a distinct front lobby that you're walking into. This is one of the more updated pictures uh, of the building here. This is actually the main office here. What you've done is just walk through the, uh, the, the front doors, you've been buzzed in, and you're in that front lobby to go into the office. What this brings you into is to the main corridor. So this is an example of, of what that would look like. Uh, you have the cafeteria here. That actually, in between these two pillars throughout, is really the main corridor that you're walking down uh, in, the main build, in the main lobby on the first floor, and the and third floor, in fact, as well. So you can see that separation there. Okay, and again, as we've talked about before, we have grade five on the first floor, grade six on the second floor, grade seven, then grade eight. So there's grade separation built in, and you can see what that flow would look like for students in the course of the day. Each neighborhood, we'll look at another picture in a moment, has their own specific interests. You heard uh, Judy and Terry talk about digital signage all over the building. Right now, what, that's what that's set up for right now. That's actually for a TV. Uh, for that digital signage. And this is a specific entrance down into one of the neighborhoods here. The classrooms for that neighborhood are actually located in the back of the hallway. And you'll see that separation in a moment. So again, the idea of what we talked about, and I think this picture gives you an idea of the flow that we're talking about. We're just using floor one, for example, but it being replicated on the other floors as well. Uh, <coughs> happens to be the front entrance. Here's a specific neighborhood right here. Okay, you'd enter right here. The maker spaces are always at the front of all the, all the neighborhoods. Serves as another, another buffer for that neighborhood area. The vast majority of all the classrooms in these neighborhoods are in the, uh, behind the, the maker space areas. So you have to have some, some type of walk to get into those areas so that all the, the regular classrooms are really separated from that main corridor that we talked about earlier. Okay, and then you can see you know, the main corridor, how it kind of ties into the cafeteria, and there's access to the outdoor learning area as well. And this all loops into, you know, if you go around the first floor, you can uh, also have access into the auditorium, and then, because um, you're right there, you can just go down one set of stairs and you're into the gymnasium as well. You know, we, we've heard before about what routines would like, and I think Judy and Terry did a nice job give an example of how some of the grade five students are using technology and we're using project-based learning to make that occur. We also have some grade six staff who've been part of that project-based learning idea and they've taken it to a, another level of how they're taking some of the routines that are really in place in, in, in the elementary level and they're bringing them up into the, into the middle school right now and I think you're gonna hear some of those themes come out here. So I've asked Mark Harrison, Shannon Fisichella, and Matt Weber to come up and talk a little bit about what they have in place right now for their routines that are uh, in grade six that are crossing over a variety of teams at this time. Good evening, uh, I'm Mark Harrison. I teach sixth grade language arts and social studies. I'm a cougar. 
Hi, I'm Andrew Fugger. <laughs> Hi, I'm Shannon Fisichella, and I teach ELA and Social Studies, the Humanities, on the Tiger team. And I'm Matt Weber, I teach Humanities on the Bobcat team, and we are here to talk to you a little bit about a PBL we did. Um, Mark, you want to start us off? Sure. Um, so, uh, Judy Miller, as was mentioned before, a lot of us are uh, taking a course on project-based learning. So, um, there's actually another teacher with us too this summer, but we sat down as um, teachers that were, you know, teaching sixth graders on two-person teams. Um, so, one of our kind of debates and issues were how do we get this small team of, you know, 60 kids to get along? Um, and we wanted to focus on communication and collaboration to start that routine off on the very first day of school. So we had sat around and we decided to do a project-based um, learning around just how do we get kids to communicate and collaborate um, and get into that routine. So we're just going to share a little bit of what we did this year and we were also planning to launch this same exact project uh, with a couple tweaks uh, for the beginning of next year. So there you are. All right, so we started with our driving question, which was how can we build and maintain a community that fosters everyone's hopes and dreams? So we asked the students to think about what their hopes and dreams were for grade six, write them down, and then we had them, on the next slide, we had them um, share all their hopes and dreams on Padlet in the classroom. So for this, they they all shared their hopes and dreams and all of the students got to see everyone's hopes and dreams although they were anonymously shared and at that point we asked them to think about how not only they could achieve their hopes and dreams for sixth grade but how they could support one another so that everybody on the whole team could achieve their hopes and dreams for sixth grade and we used that as a basis for them to create norms in the classroom that they would they would create themselves and Matt's going to talk about that so from the beginning, we wanted the students to have a buy-in to the rules in the classroom. We realized early on that we could just provide them with the rules that we created, and when they broke them, we could say, you broke our rule. But we decided in the long run, it might be better if we created them together, and when these norms were violated, we could say, you broke the rules that we came up with together. So we took those norms, uh, the hopes and dreams that they created on that last slide, and they had to look at them and how, they had to make a decision on how we were gonna achieve my goal, and every other student in the classroom's goals. And from there, we willowed down uh, to about four or five norms per team of how we were gonna behave and how we were gonna make ourselves more useful uh, to each other in the classroom. Uh, for example, we came up with things like participate and actively listen. We also came up with be positive and willing to learn. And we focused more on what they should do rather than what they shouldn't do. Because if we say don't do this and don't do that, then we can make a long list of things like that. But when we have to think about what we do want them to do, we can replace those negative behaviors with the positive behaviors that we are looking for in the classroom and those behaviors that are going to get them to collaborate and work together more fluidly. Um, and then uh, we wrapped it up. So one of the routines um, that's really important uh, for fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth graders, um, is to be able to collaborate and discuss um, ideas and concepts uh, with their fellow classmates. Um, so we worked on accountable talk, uh, and we've, I mean, you could ask any student in any of our classes, um, we're constantly having the students talk in small groups. So a huge part of um, middle school is being able to express and listen to other people's ideas. So another routine we went through is uh, using this project base is we, taught them how are we going to talk to each other in class while we're following the norms and supporting each other's hopes and dreams for the year. Um, so as we went through, this was probably, this took the first two or three weeks uh, to get this project done. Um, what we did make public were the, the norms and the students' hopes and dreams, and also um, continually making public is how students were doing for the rest of the year with um, interacting with their other classmates. And, what you're looking at here is a rubric on the left and then uh, students reflecting on how they were doing uh, in class. And that's something that has continued throughout the year. Um, we were talking before we prepared, one, and I think Judy uh, Miller had mentioned this too, technology was embedded in this. We used Padlet, we used um, uh, Google Classroom, we used, uh, what is it, Canva, 
to create the posters. Um, but, and we're gonna have all that access at the new building. Um, but what we want to make sure when we start the year, those neighborhoods that Mr. Posca pointed out, um, we want to make sure that the students coming in feel like that is their neighborhood. So the buy-in that we, we kind of got to be in this year, too, was just great. The Cougars felt like they were on Cougars teams and they had a stake in what the norms were um, and really helped uh, to build a team. But more importantly, uh, I think what we're going to see in the new school, it's a huge school, but by creating these two-person teams, the norms, working together, we're making it a smaller school right from the start. Um, and I think that's helped the, uh, the learning for everyone uh, in the classroom uh, in sixth grade. So we're also hoping, I think a majority of sixth grade teachers did this. I think almost all the teams did this project. Um, and next year, we're going to do the same thing. But I can speak for myself. It's had tremendous benefits uh, the way we started out this year. And I, I can attest to the fact that the students felt so much more comfortable after that first three weeks than I have seen in my 20 years of teaching. Um, so I just want to kind of add that. you guys have anything to yeah, No? That's it. Okay. Yeah, take the mic. Um, <laughs> you got that? Yeah, I just wanted to add to what Mark said in that I've noticed on my team that, you know, we, ha we don't have very many discipline problems because of this too, that it's the the students really want to work together and support one another beyond just the hopes and dreams, but just establishing that at the beginning, their communication and their ability to you know, support one another and collaborate was there. And it's also something that we refer to throughout the year, and they know that, like, Mar like Matt had said earlier, that they have that buy-in from the beginning, that they created them on their own, and that's made a big difference that's carried through. And we also revisited them later in the year, too, and asked them if they wanted to revise their hopes and dreams and kept that alive for them to continue and ask them if they feel like they're still supporting each other. So it's been definitely very beneficial, I agree, and, and made it more of a community. Do you want anything else? No. no. I think that's it. That's it no? Just as a, a bit of a follow-up with that, when we talked about that, the routines, this is something that is embedded in what they do in grade six. It's really a continuation and there's, there's connectivity with responsive classroom, which all of our students are getting the elementary level. So a nice connection there. And then the idea of the accountable talk is occurring not just in grade six, but it's occurring in our grade seven and eight grades. So this is a routine that's building wide that we're gonna continue with the new building as well. Talk transportation. Transportation, as Dr. Hershey said, is going, to be, is going to be rather quick. We'll try to briefly go over and get to some questions. Um, obviously, with the, with the changing landscape of, of where the middle school is located and how we have to um, you know, accommodate those students in busing, we do plan on adding some additional buses. Right now, it's somewhere between the numbers of two and three. Uh, we continue to monitor that as well. Uh, we're hoping to have some, you know, the plan is to have some designated seating on those buses for the grades to, have, to provide some separation, at least starting out early uh, in the year as we get used to this change and how we get our students to and from uh, school. Uh, there will also be some, you know, some new bus routes based upon uh, the, the, the location of the middle school, and that's why um, between Bill Burke and our new transportation director, Dana Crickshank, they'll be monitoring that and have, getting that information out to, uh, to parents so they can make those plans. One of the things that will still be in place is we still plan on having a late bus uh, at, the, at the end of the school day and that picks our students up about 345, 350 because it is our goal to have, as we talked about previously, uh, some expansion upon our extracurricular activities that our students can participate in after school. Okay. And I think that brings us to the conclusion talking about routines and things of that nature. So if there are any questions you may have about that, Ms. Norton's gonna be down in this aisle here. You can come up to the microphone there. Morning and afternoon drop off pickup. Um, what about walkers? Will both entrances be available to walkers or just one or the other? Exactly. Both, both entrances that we talked about that are available for the bus students will be available for the walkers. So, um, right now, at, I'm thinking of pickup. There are probably 30 or 40 cars that are parked in front of next to Briscoe in the side streets. Will there be an area for? parents to wait for their students? As we talked about, I'm gonna go back to that slide to try to give up some type of visual. Yeah. 
This area here is designated visitor parking. And it's the front of the building. That's the front exit here. You know, there could be some waiting that occurs there. Certainly, th there's, a, there's a, a large parking lot here. There's an, also an opportunity for parents to pick up their students there a, as well. I don't think it will look, hopefully it looks a little neater than it does right now because uh, we have more space for that to occur. Uh, this is our first step into developing this plan. We might get into this plan and identify that maybe there's a, a way to make this a little bit better. But this is going to be something that we monitor over the course of the first month to make sure it is safe and it is traffic is flowing very clearly. The only good thing I can say about Briscoe right now is that, you know, if you've been here, you can see it, it is kind of busy. There's a lot of, uh, of, of cars here. You know, probably starts about 10 of 3, 5 of 3. But I can honestly say by about 310, 315, it does clear out. So where there is some method to the madness that occurs with the, with the pickup here, and we're hoping that with the additional space that that will occur here as well. Um, will fifth grade um, have teams like sixth, seventh, and eighth do? Will they have teams? Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. If you ask me what their names are, I can't tell you what their names are going to be yet. <laughs> Got to go through the cat family some more. How far from the school do students need to be to be eligible for busing? Two miles. Two miles. Two miles? Two miles. And so within two miles, is there no busing, or is there busing, but you can pay a fee to get it? Part of my realm. <laughs> so it's actually part of a larger discussion we're having around transportation. Uh, right now, it's two miles and out. There are some within that, but it depends on where people live, uh, and it may have more to do with uh, whether the roads are walkable or not. Do you know about crossing guards yet? Crossing guards? Do we know? So we don't know about crossing guards yet. There will be some around this building that weren't around Briscoe um, because both Cabot and Balsh are fairly busy. Um, but we're also looking at where the best place for crossing guards will be with this building in mind. Anyone else in this aisle before I move over? <laughs> I'll get to you from the other side. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so quick question, as a newer Beverly family, I'm very unfamiliar to the bus situation. I drop off my twins. Will we find out more about where the bus drops off and picks up in our neighborhood and the times of dismissal and things like that as the months yeah, go you, by? You will actually get notified of where the, your bus uh, stop actually is um, and when to register for the busing. I'll move as fast as I used to. <laughs> Is there a plan to have police officers for the people turning left off of Cabot into the schools? And how? And the other question is, how does the Beverly Middle School start time compare to the start time of the other schools along the street? Do you know? Um, I know Shore starts earlier than we do, so there's actually not a conflict um, because I manage to drive by the new building every day uh, on purpose. Um, and so that offset actually works well uh, for this project. Um, the other part of your question um, on police, I think it it's going to depend. I think initially we're going to want coverage. Um, and then see how the traffic flow is. So um, we think we have a good idea on how the traffic flow is going to work, but we also know that we haven't actually operated the building yet. So um, we know, as Matt said before, that we're going to have to make some changes. We may have to make some changes as the building, um, as the building opens. Yeah, there will be. Actually, if you see the round things that are in front of the school, the round cement things, the front side is actually uh, places to sit. The back side is, is bicycle um, places to lock up your bikes. Are you going to, uh, the kids here at Briscoe can come as early almost as 7 o'clock 
Are we going to maintain that open building access, especially with you potentially cutting bus routes? More kids are probably going to get dropped off. We do plan on having, um, much like what we do currently, I mean, we buildings open pretty early. Some students get here as early as 7.15, 7.30. So we do plan on having a plan in place for supervision in the cafeteria beginning at 8 o'clock. So that plan is, um, is still in place going forward. I think we're all set, Ms. Okay. Moore. Sounds good. Okay, I'm going to ask uh, Troy Randall from AI3 to come up for our next. Thank you, Matt. Well, before, before I get um, started with the discussion on safety and security, I just want to say that over the last 20 years, we have been in many, many districts across the Commonwealth. And to see the participation that we have here tonight, and I know there have been many community meetings uh, uh, leading up to the opening of the uh, new middle school. This is fantastic. This is awesome. And I'm not surprised because uh, even early in the process, the administration has been uh, updating and uh, working with the staff and administration uh, to really develop a system so that when this building is open uh, this coming year, it is 100% full speed ahead and there's no hiccups along the way. So kudos to you guys for, for being interested in participating in this process and to the administration. Now, the project started nearly three years ago uh, in the planning process and uh, it started with visioning sessions. Visioning educational visioning sessions. That also included safety and security. And the administration had been, prior to us coming on board, had been also uh, doing their own visioning sessions before that. The discussions, as I said, included safety and security as well as a strong component of educational uh, discussions. Since that point in time, the working group um, uh, headed by uh, Mayor Cahill and uh, Dr. Hershey and Matt and his, his um, uh, group, as well as um, uh, the school committee. Uh, specifically, I'd like, just like to mention um, Chris Silverstein and Paul Manzo, who have been at every single um, working group meeting in the last three years. And this isn't a meeting that we meet at uh, you know, once a month, once every couple months. It's weekly during the design process and bi-weekly during the construction process. So over the last three years, uh, there have been many, many meetings, many discussions, and uh, many of the topics of safety and security started at the very beginning. And I just want to say that as we start the discussions in a design process with safety and security, it's at 30,000 feet. It's looking at the big picture. Many, uh, many think of safety and security as a technology component. It's really, star it starts, like I said, at 30,000 feet before pen and paper has even touched um, each other and what we call passive security. And so, there's, there's a series of, uh, of standards that's adopted by safety and security standards, adopted by uh, the Massachusetts Department of Education, the Massachusetts School Building Authority, as well as the uh, United States Department of Education. These standards are the crime prevention through environmental design. Again, it's, it's high level. It is looking at placement of the building. It's looking at the uh, adjacencies of program. It's looking at main entrances in reference to uh, the uh, main thoroughfares and the entrances to the site and the building. It's looking, down break, looking at breaking down the cohort size into manageable components, manageable sizes. I'll get into that in just one moment. Uh, it looks at uh, appropriate, uh, appropriately sized corridors and uh, stairs within the building. 
looking at passive observation, observing through uh, seen and be seen principles, both on site and within the building. Then there's the, uh, the second layer of uh, security and safety, and that is the technology component. That's where intrusion detection comes into play. That's where closed circuit TV systems come into play. Access control and the uh, phone system. The phone system is a big component of that. The third component, the third prong of the uh, standards is security policies. Those are developed within the district and the uh, uh, law enforcement, local law enforcement. I won't get into, uh, into those details uh, tonight, but we'll just talk about uh, passive and active securities. So, Matt, if you wouldn't mind going to the uh, site plan. Thank you. One of the things that, um, that as, uh, as I mentioned, very beginning in the process, Mayor Cahill, Dr. Hershey, and Matt, and, and um, others, one of the very first discussions that we had was talking about site placement of the building. Where was, uh, where's the best positioning of the building from a site security standpoint? Was the main entrance, which is here, very clearly defined and visible from uh, Cabot Street? The secondary entrance here, visible from Balt Street? And then the overall site, making sure that it's an open plan. This, you're fortunate with this, uh, this particular site. Many districts and school uh, 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 placement and sites aren't as open as this one here. So you're really fortunate to be able to see across the entire site, around the building, without obstruction. That's a really important component. As I mentioned, clearly defined edges around the perimeter. It's, it's very clear that as you walk onto the site, this is the school site. This is a school. Main approach to the building, an entry plaza. Important that that's clear, that's open, that's defined. And that there is, uh, there were many discussions about what that looked like. Where were, uh, where is the definition between walk, walking pathway uh, planters, entry, uh, how large is this space, what the uh, vehicular circulation was, drop off within that area, uh, uh, boulders or uh, bollards along the front entrance. The ultimate, de ultimate decision was to uh, uh, put natural, bo natural boulders, boulders as bollards uh, instead of just having a line of bollards along the uh, main entry a more natural feel. What about the secondary entrance, the approach, the um, uh, passage uh, between uh, the vehicle and the uh, entrance? What does that look like, Is that uh, clear and open? The next thing, um, as we move into the building, a few things I just want to point out. As the working group talked about and discussed the potential options for uh, adjacencies and uh, program location. One of the primary, uh, primary, primary objectives, as uh, Mr. Posca outlined with the organization of the building, is a very simplistic plan organization, clear sight lines, easy access and, and uh, movement of students and also breaking down the cohort size to manageable sizes which educationally is very beneficial but it also has a, um, a benefit to security. As, uh, as Mr. Posca said, there are 12 neighborhoods, three of these neighborhoods on each floor with a maker space at the entrance of each of the neighborhoods and then cafeteria on the first and third floor. So distributed cafeteria, fifth and sixth on the first floor, seven and eight on the 
third floor. What that does, in, in addition to that, one of the other components for safety and security is having distributed administration. What that means is, traditionally, uh, the administration would be in a central uh, or an entrance area, and that would be the location. There would, uh, faculty and staff would be uh, placed in their classrooms, but the other administrative positions would not be distributed throughout. So having distributed administration within the center of the building with clear sight lines uh, throughout provides that additional, additional oversight. Remember, exterior and interior, seen and be seen. The cafeteria, traditionally, as I mentioned, uh, in, in this uh, particular scheme, the decision was both educationally and, and from a security perspective was to have it distributed on first and third floor. Traditionally, it would, all of the students would be uh, placed into one, uh, one space, one cafeteria space. The, um, the next component, as I mentioned, oh, one, two, two other things. Um, one is the, the um, technology and the integration of technology, the active security. The active security is, um, uh, has, has several components to it. First is the automatic um, uh, entry system in the accessible entry system, which is, uh, you probably have seen it in the other schools, uh, where the, the front doors are locked and you need to provide visual and physical access uh, into the space, into the building. The control point here in the admin uh, is just that. It provides the uh, control, the visual, both visual, direct visual access to the exterior and to the entranceway, and also through the technology, through the camera, visual access through the camera in order to get in the building. The second component is with intrusion detection. Now intrusion detection is a safety feature that uh, is a motion detector, detector within every single space within the first floor. It's, on, it's uh, connected to the windows, has a motion detector in the space, uh, detection of exterior doors, this signals movement and also signals an a audible alarm, but also uh, an event in uh, digital uh, technology uh, transfer to whoever is, um, uh, is scheduled to receive it. The next component is the CCTV, the closed circuit uh, TV system. This building, a lot of discussion about CCTV, both with the working group as well as um, uh, the technology group and the local uh, law enforcement with placement of cameras, quantity of cameras, as well as uh, future expansion. So this building, both interior and exterior, will have over 200 cameras um, in the building when it's complete and then that can be expanded by almost another 100 cameras uh, if necessary. Uh, we, talk, we talked a lot about the uh, uh, command center, control point uh, within the building, second floor, replication of the first floor, distributed uh, administration. As we continue, just one, one final note is we've talked about a lot of topics, um, discussed a lot of topics in the working group meetings uh, from door hardware to glass and glazing uh, between classroom and corridor, uh, about positioning of uh, entryways to classrooms, uh, the positioning of transparency to classrooms, uh, clear sight lines. The c discussions continue to happen. We have been, as even as um, recently as, as um, uh, last week, we were talking about 
uh, implementing and looking at other strategies. So the, the conversation that we have had uh, over the last three years has continued um, and will continue uh, even after the, uh, the building is open. So uh, the working group led by um, Mayor Cahill is, um, uh, is on task and has been for a very long time and uh, the continued discussion um, will occur. Thank you very much. Um, just real quick, uh, one of the things that, that Troy just struggled with a little bit is that the detail of security in the building uh, we can't talk about. Um, so the nice part is to, if you think about over 200 cameras, kind of assume they're everywhere. Um, but when we have an opportunity to talk about those things, we have to make sure that we know that our audience could contain someone that we have to worry about. Um, so it's important that we don't provide as much detail as you might want as parents. Uh, training for staff and students, not only do we need to do Alice training, but as soon as we get in that building, we've got to train the staff and the kids on an entirely new building. Um, and that progress is what we're working on now to make sure that um, we have exactly where the signage needs to be, exactly where the students need to figure out um, how to exit the building, where the exits are, uh, what's the best way to do that. So all of that training also is going to have to go on as we move into the building. All of the systems, uh, the staff will be trained on this summer. Um, that's part of taking over the building. Um, so there will be a lot of activity as we open this, this building next year around getting used to the new building. Um, and then finally, there's a lot of embedded safety features in the building. Um, and there's a lot of work that we've done around that. Um, one of the key pieces, and having been a principal, um, I think one of the nice parts about this building is being able to see out um, and being able to see uh, if there's anything, any activity that we need to worry about. And that's a big difference. Um, it's hard for us to translate that to you until you're actually in the building. Uh, so we can't wait until you're actually in the building and can see the kinds of things that we do. Our problem is that we just can't get you in there until at least July. So um, we are, as Troy said, we're looking at other things now. One of our challenges are the same challenges any school district's going through right now. Um, I get 75 emails a day that has the exact security solution for Beverly um, and making sure that we go through uh, those solutions that someone else has for us and figure out what's the best thing for Beverly and what's the best thing for the buildings that we're actually operating under. Um, but that's a constant thing that we're working on and as Troy said, we're still uh, working on the new building uh, right now um, and determining whether there are any things that we want to consider in addition to what we've seen already. So that in a nutshell is what we're talking about. Um, if you have questions, uh, we'll be happy to answer them. If uh, you're, you want questions about the other buildings, um, that's next Monday, uh, so please come back. Um, and if any of you want to hang around afterwards, I'll stay around if you have any questions. So, yes? I have a question about the, uh, the, the huge windows, the cafeteria. Is yep. that one of the things you're looking at? Because I don't know um, how strong they are, I guess, um, in light of recent events. Um, is there something that can be done in the construction to make sure that someone with bad motives couldn't yep. So that's, that's one of the things that we're looking at. Um, also from the standpoint of understanding sort of the motivation of somebody. Um, and when we think about it, um, you know, it may be that someone's going to go, no matter how many windows there are, they're actually going to go to the doors anyway because they're not thinking straight at that point. The other piece that we know, which is important, um, and Troy touched on a little bit, on every floor that we have, there is a teacher's room um, and also uh, there are administrative um, offices. They all have windows looking out um, on the outside area. So anyone crossing that area as an individual would be seen. Um, but we're also looking at anything else that we might want to consider. Yes? So uh, are you guys looking at 
in maybe enhance security in the at the entrance at the entrances of the building, such as maybe student uh, ID cards or verification cards. So, um, so we're not at this point, but we may look at that. One of the things that the staff will certainly have is these. Uh, it's very similar to what the high school is. Um, it's very interesting from the standpoint of staff because this actually records who came into the building, when they came into the building, um, and we have, a, we have a record of that. Uh, the gentleman who just spoke, I don't remember his name, um, he mentioned something about glass glazing. At a previous meeting, uh, there was a lot of talk about how exciting and excited it is to have these big open windows out of every single classroom. Has there been any talk? What is the, the, the strength of that glass? I assume when you use a term like glazing, that's what a nice fancy technical term uh, for bulletproof, and I'm going to ask straight out, is there, pl I mean, my kids come home and talk about sheltering in place and stuff like that. So if we're going to keep them in classrooms if there's someone in the building, is that glass going to be able to stop them? <coughs> So we're looking at some options. I wouldn't say it's I wouldn't say it's bulletproof glass um, because that's actually five inches thick, uh, as I understand it. Um, but we are looking at whether or not we want to uh, provide some enhancements to it. Um, one of the key pieces is the majority of the students are going to be at the back end of the building in those academic areas. So one of the things that um, when we look at it uh, from a security standpoint is that building can actually be evacuated out the back very easily if someone was to come in the front um, and vice versa. So if somebody was to come in the back, we could evacuate the building pretty easily, which is part of the ALICE training that the kids and the staff are going through. So you, you, you keep saying we're looking at, when will we have some definitive answers? Um, that's something that, uh, that, uh, that has a team looking at it, not me okay. alone. Fair enough, I just, yep. you know, I, I canceled yep. plans and took work off to be here tonight and yep. we got a lot of vague generalities and it's scary and I'd like some answers. <laughs> I'm just curious with the neighborhood, how you have uh, each neighborhood is a straight line down and there's uh, four different floors. Say someone was in the far right neighborhood on the second floor, would there be a way to shut down all the other neighborhoods so that during a uh, shelter in place this way, no one can get down into those neighborhoods should there be someone that isn't supposed to be in the building in the building to protect the students? There are not doors at the end of those corridors, no. There, I'm not sure I heard your question because I'm I my hearing isn't great. Is there a way to lock down each individual neighborhood? Should someone be in a neighborhood that shouldn't be there? Would there be a way to lock down all the rest of the neighborhoods so there, no one can get yeah. down those hallways? There are not doors on the end of those hallways. However, there is the ability to lock down all of those doors in the classrooms. You guys have talked a lot about visibility of the students. Um, in the event that something were to happen, do you have security guards that, or, or some type of security personnel that would be inside the building? Um, because it's a major concern for me as a parent to know that my kids are going to be seen by everybody that walks in the building. Um, innocent or not, that's, that's just a major concern. Again, I apologize, I couldn't hear. <laughs> Is it on? Uh, Can you hear me now? <laughs> so there's not, there's not security guards in the building. We are, however, looking at a uh, second school resource officer. I apologize. My hearing's going. <laughs> so there won't be security guards, but we're looking at a second SRO, which would actually be stationed at the middle school. Are there any talks about getting security personnel in the building? I think, you know, especially these days and in light of things that have happened around the country, it may be a good idea to at least have the ability to protect our students other than you know being able to monitor it on a CCTV camera 
There hasn't been at this point, but there are working groups going on uh, in Beverly right now between the police and the school department uh, to look at any recommendations that we would want to make. We're as concerned as you are. Any last words, Matt? I'm just curious what the difference is between a security guard and a school resource officer as far as their capabilities. So school resource officer is a Beverly police officer and that goes through the school resource officer training. So it's trained to work with kids. Um, so we get a lot of extras out of the school resource officer. So it's not just security, it's working with kids and getting to know kids well. <laughs> um, to piggyback off the hearing issue, I want to make sure that all alarms in the building are visual. And so if there's a shelter in place, we have some students, my son being one of them, who can't hear over the loudspeaker. So I hear about these TV screens, and I want to be sure that they are um, connected right now. Uh, so that if there's a shelter in place, my son can see that there's a shelter in place. Right. <laughs> Do you wanna? So there's all sorts of code uh, requirements that we have right now around visual as well as auditory. Um, so those visual pieces will be there. The second piece we're also looking at is the ability to push out over the devices um, anything that we want to from the standpoint of instruction to kids. Um, with the one-to-one, -one, with the amount of devices that we're going to have in kids' hands in the classroom, we will be able to push things out over that. So there's not going to be a system that incorporates the, these TV screens throughout the visual image? Absol yeah, absolutely, there will be. Yep. Different than a visual fire. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yep. Yeah, there absolutely is. I was actually going beyond your question, because we have even more capability than that. So with the staff, the staff's going to have this and they will be able to do, they would be able to go through the recognition. Um, all of them have our pictures on it, so there's a requirement that we do that. Um, from the standpoint of students at this point, um, we're not looking at that. Um, may we want to? I'm not sure. Um, but right now, you know, we, we, the kids once they're in, um, you know, we pretty much know where they are. Um, the other part about this building is that you can really, there's no dead spots in the building uh, where kids can, or anyone can hide, um, which was actually one of the beautiful features of this building. So if I'm not mistaken right now, there's really only one entrance, which is the front entrance in the morning, but it sounds like the new plan is to have three entrances for bus and two different car drop-offs, so that seems like a lot of unsupervised access points in the morning starting at 7 that are unsupervised. Is there going to so, be something done So those that? three areas are not going to be unsupervised. Um, and they're going to be very specific. So when the buses come in, the buses are going to drop off. Those kids are going to go right in through the cafeteria. There will be supervision there. Uh, the students that are dropped off on Cabot Street, there will be supervision on that end, and there will also be supervision on the other end for the kids that are dropped off on Balt Street. The building will be open, but we won't have supervision in place till 8 a.m. So that's the reality, but we don't. School starts at 8.30, so that's when we get staff here for the supervision beginning at 8. So, the, so all those doors are going to be open starting at 7, though? So, or are you only going to have one open for earlier arrivals? Not all. Well, exactly. Are we talking about one early arrival door? Yes, that's what I'm kind of getting at, I guess. That there's three entrances. That might be something that should probably be super looked at if there's going to be no supervision at those entrances until 8. Well, the, with choice, we could keep students outside, but I think the students feel safer inside. We want them supervised inside. No, no, I mean to get in the doors. Like if the doors are unlocked, and all three entrances, and there's nobody there to watch who's walking in at those entrances. So we'll that's, take a, that's. I guess we could look at it, but that's 
that's at seven o'clock we want you know we don't want students outside maybe you know, particularly in the winter but we want no, that's students what I'm saying. I'm just saying, the doors be so the question is at at seven o'clock will we have one entrance open for the early arrivals or oh. will all three be open I think that's the, the, again that we can look at that that's a I understand now you know for, for students and for staff entering we might just be once once we get to eight o'clock we can open up other doors we can have more supervision there I understand your your question now Who's gonna watch there is no supervision from 7 to 8. That's the, that's the we do not have supervision at this time from 7 to 8. Would that be something the school would want to think about? Um, I teach high school in Medford, and they've started putting someone at the door at 6.30. As we, kids coming in, there's, it's a staff member, but just to make sure that there's an adult presence there. So what we're what, I mean, as we're talking about getting increased supervision starting at 8 o'clock, you know, how, how much further, earlier can we go? It's trying to find that staff available to get there that early. That's why we feel comfortable getting staff there at 8. As we get earlier, that becomes a challenge. Yes? Yeah, want to talk loud? <laughs> Go ahead. I th absolutely I think that's the you know the conversations that we have on a regular basis with our school resource officer with the Beverly police the trainings that they're going to which are at a much higher level than we're at they're, they're constantly talking to us about what's going on you know how that's emerged that's how the Alice training has emerged based upon what they've learned throughout the country and what they're trying to do so certainly our, our, our relationship and our connections with the Beverly police and having a, a, a school resource officer who's due to be, who's readily available to communicate with us, has only enhanced these conversations. And our training is evolving based on what we learn as well. Um, not only recommendations from the police, but recommendations that we see from colleagues. Um, you know, we, there's a lot of listserv uh, for superintendents, principals. Obviously, it's a major topic. Um, around the country right now so all of that goes into play from the standpoint of what training we want to do as well as what what um, decisions we want to make around buildings hi um, I just wanted to start by saying thank you for having this meeting it's not an easy one but it's really important um, I keep hearing about this command center and all these TVs um, all the cameras are we actually going to be having someone either manning or womaning whether it's the new resource officer which is an awesome idea or is it going to be another responsibility of the poor school secretaries so I just I'm wondering who's going to be watching those are they going to or is it more like a tape thing that you review later it's a combination of all of those to be honest with okay. you uh, including having access we will have administration will have access to the cameras via our technology as well so we don't have to be at a command center per, per se. We can have be having more of a mobile command center. But you know, the first the focal point is at that that main entrance. And then the course of the day, and I think as Troy pointed out, the visibility of, of the clerical staff to visualize and be able to see who they're buzzing in. That's that first step of that command center per se. We can, we actually had that conversation just the other day. Um, so not only that, but remember that officers all have laptops in their cars um, and with the phone system we'll have in this uh, particular building, uh, they'll be able to pull up any of the cameras and any of the camera shots right directly from the cruisers. Just the, the main office as we're in right now. I mean, I think that's the conversation that 
uh, woman up back said what it will look like for early dropout. We have to let staff in. Does it become that we just let staff in through the use of a buzz car or something like that? That might be the access card. We don't open up officially till till eight o'clock. Uh, do we set up some type of program for early drop off? I, I think that's the, the conversations that have to occur. But right now the plan is that you know have, we have supervision starting at eight o'clock based upon what we're planning for with our staffing pattern. Going forward, how we have accessibility in the building prior to that is something we'll let, have to look at. I, 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 I hear that, but I also I, I have concerns when I come in and I see students who are waiting outside and it's cold out. As Dr. Hershey said, we'll be around. If you have any other individual questions, we'd be happy to stay up here this evening and talk to you some more. Thank you so much for coming out this evening. I appreciate it.